Well, thanks for joining me today. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is T.C. Bonke, and I'm the National Account Manager for the Testing Division here at JK. And today we're going to be talking about uh, environmental testing. This is the third webinar in our series. We've talked about vibration testing uh, and also solar simulation testing in the past. So let's start off with talking about what environmental testing is. It is the exposure of a specimen to environmental conditions that may affect its function or its life. <laughs> and these conditions can include temperature, humidity, uh, various forms of precipitation, corrosive elements, ice and frost, and then also condensation. So why is it important for us to perform environmental testing? Environmental testing is used to simulate stress on products that are caused by environmental loads. And I've just included some images here of some products that we've performed environmental testing on and that also experience these environmental loads out in the field. So if you look at the top left-hand corner there, you can see a door panel that's obviously gone through some significant warpage, um, which was caused by environmental conditions, uh, most likely temperature variations. Also moving to the right, you can see some ice buildup on a compressor, which is something that uh, we simulate quite often in our lab as well. And fiber optic cables, also experience a great deal of temperature uh, swings. So we perform testing on fiber optic cables and reels as well. And now if you look down at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see an automotive undercarriage, which has clearly gone through some pretty extensive rust. So corrosion testing is another important type of environmental testing that can be performed. Uh, and then also a lot of times we'll perform environmental testing with an operational component to see how parts actually operate at these different uh, extreme conditions. And a good example of that, of that is actually testing on firearms. And then uh, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, an image of an outdoor display. Uh, and this is another type of product that we run into with environmental testing a lot because a lot of times that display, when it's exposed to these conditions, can go through some display failure and some discoloration. And you can actually see in this image we do have some discoloration here in the top right-hand corner of that display. So now going through the different types of environmental testing that we're gonna to touch on today, we've got accelerated light testing, also referred to as ALT or ALT testing, climate aging and cycling, temperature and humidity shock, corrosion testing, specifically salt spray testing, icing and de-icing testing, condensing humidity, and then various forms of precipitation testing. <laughs> so before we go into the different types of environmental testing, first I wanna talk a little bit about the effects that temperature can have on material. Uh, temperature is one of the main parameters in an environmental test, so it's important to understand how temperature can affect your parts. And essentially it can affect the ductility of material which can affect the operation at temperature. So typically materials are gonna be a bit more ductile at high temperatures, and they're gonna be more brittle at low temperatures. Um, so we can, we can use that temperature testing to see how these materials operate at different temperatures. Also climate cycling is going to cause expansion and contraction of your parts, and this can lead to stress, especially at material interfaces. If you think about a part that's got different materials within it, you're gonna have parts that are expanding and contracting at different rates, um, and that's gonna impose compression and also tensile and shear forces at those component interfaces. Uh, and then thermal shock testing involves a rapid change in temperature, uh, and this can create stress cracks on the surface of materials, um, especially in materials with a low thermal conductivity. Oftentimes you actually can't see these surface cracks with the naked eye, uh, but if you see that image uh, down at the bottom of the screen, that's a magnified image where you can actually see some surface cracks. And over time, those surface cracks will reduce the strength of the material. <clears throat> also, high temperatures can actually break chemical bonds of polymers. Um, so for instance, you can see polyethylene there at the bottom of the screen. And at a high temperature, you can have a bond break, for instance, between this carbon and hydrogen atom. And when that bond breaks, it actually releases free radicals. And when the free radicals are released, you can actually have uh, branching 
off of that chain. And that branching eventually is going to cause permanent material embrittlement. And since we talked about the effects of temperature, we also have to touch a bit on the effects of humidity, since this is also a very important parameter in environmental testing. And there are effects of both high and low humidity. On the high humidity side, it can cause corrosion. It can also expose weak seals, especially when it's combined with temperature cycling. So as, as a part goes through temperature cycling, you're going to have that expanding and contracting that we talked about, which can facilitate uh, moisture movement across seals. So it's important to have a high humidity environment in that case to help expose those weak sealing solutions. And high humidity can also cause electrical faults, such as electrical shorting, and may also reduce the efficacy of adhesives. Now, on the low humidity side, a low humidity environment can facilitate electric static discharge. Uh, and this is essentially because humidity in the air is going to allow electrons to flow through the air. Um, and so in a low humidity environment, you might run into problems with electric static discharge. And also low humidity can cause materials to dry and crack. A good example of this that I'm sure you've all experienced is um, that image in the bottom right-hand corner, which is a tire which has gone through some pretty extensive dry rotting. So now let's talk about the first type of environmental testing, which is climate aging. Climate aging is used to evaluate a product's operation at an elevated temperature or reduced temperature, or it can also be used to evaluate a product's operation after a given period of time. So you may want to see how your product operates at this high temperature or at this low temperature when it's actually in the chamber, or you might want to expose your part uh, to these extreme temperatures for a given period of time to see what kind of permanent effects it's going to have on your part uh, and perform that operational testing after the aging period. Climate aging is also oftentimes used to determine shelf life, which is referred to as accelerated life testing. And uh, this testing can be accelerated by using more extreme temperatures, both on the high and the low end. And one of the most difficult uh, parts of setting up a climate aging test is figuring out your acceleration factor. The best way to do this is actually experimentally. Um, you can have products in the field and also run different climate aging tests in the lab and compare them to figure out um, a good acceleration factor. But if you're limited on data, um, you can actually use this Arrhenius equation as a good starting point for figuring out uh, an approximate acceleration factor. So you can see in this equation here, AF stands for your acceleration factor. E sub A is your activation energy. Um, this value is actually based on material properties. Typically, it's determined experimentally. Um, but again, if you're limited on the data you have, typically a standard value of 0.7 electron volts can be used. And then you've got your two temperatures, both the use temperature, which is the temperature that your part's actually going to see in the field, and T sub T, which is your test temperature. Uh, and keep in mind, both of these are in Kelvin, which will be important when you plug them into the equation. And then K is just your Boltzmann constant. So let's run through an example of setting up a test. Let's say you've got a product that has an operating temperature of 50 degrees C, and you want to accelerate that and test the product at 100 degrees C. In this case, you plug everything into your equation. Uh, in this case, we do use 0 0.7 as our activation energy value. Um, and then we plug in our temperatures, of course, adding 273 to them to convert to Kelvin. And we come up with an acceleration factor of 29. So if you're testing your part um, in the lab for one day, that's going to equate to 29 days in the field. And the next type of testing I want to talk about is climate cycling. Um, and again, this is used uh, for a couple different reasons. It can be used to evaluate products function at varying temperatures. So you might want to see how your product operates at both the high and low temperatures, or it can be used to evaluate a product's function or operation after a given number of cycles. So again, you might want to see um, the more uh, permanent degradation that can happen because of climate cycling and actually run these cycles for a given number of cycles and then perform your operational testing after those cycles are completed. 
Um, again, as we touched on a little bit before, this climate cycling is going to create a cyclic expansion and contraction of your opponents, which is going to create stresses um, in your components and especially at those component interfaces. Uh, and also keep in mind that the ramp rate is going to affect the rate of expansion and contraction. Um, so that is going to affect the stress imposed on the part as well. And just like with climate aging, we do have an equation for your acceleration factor for climate cycling as well. Uh, it's a little bit different in this case. Um, AF still stands for your acceleration factor. You've still got both your temperatures, both your use and your test temperature. Um, but now we've got a beta value, which is based on material properties. Again, a good way to determine the exact value for this is to do so experimentally, but we do have some guidelines. Uh, again, if you're limited on data, if you're using, uh, if you're performing testing on metals, typically we use a beta value of approximately two, and for plastics, our beta values are gonna be around five. Also keep in mind that this equation is not going to take into account uh, your cycle frequency or your ramp rate. Um, which could affect your acceleration factor a bit. So this equation isn't a perfect equation, uh, but it is a good starting point if you're trying to figure out um, your acceleration factor for testing. So we'll go through an example with this one as well. Let's see, you've got a plastic product that typically, typically operates between negative 10 degrees and 30 degrees Celsius. So you wanna accelerate this a bit. So we're gonna choose um, a cycling between negative 20 degrees and 65 degrees Celsius. So if we plug this into the equation, this is a plastic product, so we're gonna assume a beta value of five. And in this case, we come up with an acceleration factor of 43. So next we'll talk a bit about temperature and humidity shock testing. This is very similar to climate cycling, but that change in temperature is gonna be a lot quicker. Uh, and you can see here a basic setup of a temperature humidity shock chamber. It's actually essentially two chambers that are combined together, one being the hot side and the other being the cold side. And you've got essentially what equates to an elevator that's actually going to automate the process and bring your part between the hot and cold sides uh, to impose that temperature shock on the part. Um, and because the temperature change is so much more rapid than a climate cycle test, you are going to have quicker expansion and contraction, which is going to lead to increased stress at the component interfaces and can also lead to surface cracks, as we touched on a little bit before. So a good example of this um, is actually if you've got a glass of ice and you pour warm water on it, you can hear and see that cracking of the ice when it undergoes that temperature shock. And this is also a common cause of head gasket failure. So that's a part um, that we see a lot that undergoes temperature shock testing. And now I'm going to touch on sun simulation testing a bit. Uh, I won't go into this in too much detail because we actually did perform um, a full webinar on sun simulation testing. So if you'd like some more information, you can go on the J.A. King website um, and actually check out that full webinar. It is uploaded on our website. Um, but to give you the basics, there's a few different types of sun simulation testing. There is natural exposure, which is really, um, it's what it sounds like. It's actually taking apart, putting it outside and letting the sun do the work for you. And then we've also got our artificial types of sun simulation testing, xenon arc and fluorescent UV testing, which are both for testing uh, mostly smaller parts, test plaques um, and things of that nature. And then you've got full spectrum solar simulation using metal halide bulbs and that's the picture you can see on the right, where those bulbs are actually in a full climate chamber. It's useful for testing full vehicles and much larger products. Uh, and the main reason we actually use sun simulation testing is to evaluate color fade, part deterioration, heating effects, and then also component warpage. And the next type of testing we're going to touch on is precipitation testing. Now, this can involve really any type of precipitation, including rain, snow, and hail. Uh, one of the main reasons that we actually undergo precipitation testing is to check for water ingress. So you can see on the right there, we've got a picture of a smartphone. Obviously, smartphones, other electronics, you want to try and reduce water ingress as much as possible. You don't want that water to actually get in to the electrical components of the device. So precipitation testing is a good way of going about this. 
And when we're doing precipitation testing to check for water ingress specifically, we'll actually want to impose a temperature differential between the part itself and the ambient air. And what this is gonna do is actually cause a pressure gradient, which is going to facilitate water ingress by actually creating a more low pressure environment inside the part and actually pulling that water into the part, which is gonna help create a more aggressive test. Some other things to look for in precipitation testing and reasons for performing precipitation testing are material swelling and increased weight, which are both the result of your part actually taking on that moisture. Also electrical failure, uh, corrosion of the part, fungal growth, and then more on the mechanical side of precipitation testing is hail damage. And those tests are usually performed on roofing materials, siding, and then also automotive exterior components. And the next type of testing we're gonna to touch on here is icing and de-icing. This actually involves building up a layer of ice on the exterior of the park. It's typically used uh, to test aerospace, marine, and also rail components. It's, it can be useful to evaluate de-icing methods. So if your park, for instance, has a de-icing method, including heaters, or perhaps a chemical de-icing method, um, we can build up ice on the part to help evaluate those methods. Um, also keep in mind, icing can cause uh, material cracking. Uh, it also adds weight to parts and it can inhibit movement um, of actuating components. Um, and also ice buildup can impede electrical instrumentation, uh, including antennas, optical devices, uh, and meteorological equipment. And so our next type of testing is salt spray or salt fog testing. Um, this is a type of corrosion testing that's used to evaluate the corrosive properties uh, of the part itself or the coating. <clears throat> uh, one thing to keep in mind with salt spray, uh, while it is the most common type of corrosion testing, there are some downsides to it. One being that, unfortunately, there's no universal acceleration factor. Uh, and this is mainly due to the fact that the acceleration factor is dependent on so many different variables. Uh, it's depending on the material itself, um, the coating that's used, uh, and the actual product use location as well. So typically salt spray or salt fog testing is used for comparison purposes only. So for instance, if you've got coating A and coating B and you wanna see which one holds up to a corrosive environment for a longer period of time, you can put both, both of these parts or test plaques inside the chamber and see which one actually has rust first. Um, also, this test can include scribing, which actually involves cutting through that top coating or cutting through the actual material itself. And the reason for performing this scribing before we put the sample into the test chamber is to evaluate rust creepage away from that initial scribe line and also coating delamination. Now, there are a few different types of solutions that can be used for salt spray testing. The most common is definitely NSS, neutral salt spray solution, which is just a 5% salt water solution. But if you wanna get a bit more aggressive with the test, there are uh, more aggressive solutions that can be used, including acetic acid salt spray, uh, and then cast solution as well. And now actually for the final type, of environmental testing we're gonna to touch on today, we've got uh, condensing humidity testing. And this uses a temperature gradient to actually induce condensation on the surface of the part itself. <clears throat> it's typically used to evaluate coatings as it simulates dew formation on the surface of the part. Um, and it is, the test is designed to evaluate the resistance to, resistance to corrosion, as well as um, the other effects of high humidity environments that we touched on a little bit earlier uh, in this presentation. And the reason that condensing humidity testing can be so useful uh, for evaluating the resistance to corrosion is that condensation by its nature contains a large amount of dissolved oxygen. So when this uh, oxygen rich moisture attaches itself to the surface of the part, that can heavily contribute to corrosion more so than just, for instance, a precipitation test or high humidity test would. Um, and also keep in mind that condensing humidity testing can be combined with other corrosion tests, such as salt spray testing, and what's referred to as a cyclic corrosion testing. 
but typically these cycle tests will include two different stages, usually consisting of a condensing humidity portion, a salt spray portion, and then a drying portion as well. And now I wanna to just touch on the measuring and monitoring equipment a little bit that's used in these tests. Um, the two most common types of sensors uh, for testing are thermocouples and humidity sensors, again, because those are your main parameters of environmental testing, temperature and humidity. Thermocouples, uh, at the very least, are gonna be used to control your actual test equipment, um, but they can also be placed on the actual surface or the interior of the part during testing as well, so that you can monitor your actual part temperature during testing, as this might be different from the ambient air temperature. And then your humidity sensors are primarily going to be used uh, just to control the actual test equipment itself. Um, one thing to keep in mind with humidity sensors is that they oftentimes don't operate effectively below the freezing point. Um, so for instance, on climate cycle tests, you'll actually see most of these tests, um, once the temperature falls below zero degrees Celsius, there's no more requirement for uh, humidity control at those cold temperatures. And then two other pieces of measurement that I wanna to touch on are your pH and conductivity meters. Both of these are used for corrosion testing, uh, especially salt spray testing. And this is to verify that solution that you're using. pH meter, of course, is used to verify the salt solution pH and the conductivity meter that is used to verify your salt concentration. Um, and the reason these are important um, is not just to verify the solution uh, before the testing, but that atomization process can actually affect the pH and the salt concentration during testing. So it's important to periodically double check your pH and your conductivity throughout testing. Most of these specifications are gonna require you to check these values every day or at least every few days throughout the duration of the test. And now I just wanna to touch on a few common specifications um, that you may run into um, for environmental testing. For climate testing, there's a ton of different specifications out there, um, including OEM specs, uh, but a good go-to is MIL standard 810G, methods 501.5 and 502.5, and these also provide some guidelines for climate testing as well. For corrosion testing, the most common specifications by far are for salt spray, and they are ASTM B117 and ISO 9227. Uh, for precipitation testing, again, there's a few specifications out there, um, but typically a, a good go-to is MIL standard 810G, and in this case, it is method 506.5. And then for condensing humidity, we've got ISO 6270. Now we touched a little bit on operational testing at temperature, so I just wanted to give a good example of some testing we've done that incorporates both a climate portion and your operational portion of testing. And that's the testing we've performed uh, on firearms. As you can see, uh, the firearm is mounted inside a climate chamber. Um, so it is gonna undergo extreme temperatures and humidities. But in this case, we also have essentially a range set up in our climate chamber too. So we can go through that operational testing at temperature as well. And now to touch on our capabilities, here at the J. King Test Lab a bit. Um, for climate testing, we've got a range of different climate chambers, ranging from small reach-in style chambers to very large drive-in chambers that are up to 18 by nine by 10 feet. Um, in terms of the actual temperature that can be imposed itself, we can go down to a low limit of negative 70 degrees Celsius and all the way up to 180 degrees Celsius. We do also have chambers that can be used for temperature and humidity shock testing. In terms of corrosion, we can perform both neutral salt and cast testing. Uh, for precipitation, we can handle pretty much all types of precipitation that you might need, including rain, snow, and hail testing. And then we do also have a condensing humidity chamber that conforms to ISO 6270. And that is it for the presentation on environmental testing. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, so the question is, which products are more susceptible to climate cycling? Um, this can be um, slightly affected by the actual material properties. So as a general rule of thumb, for instance, plastics are gonna deform a bit more 
during climate cycling than metals are going to. Um, also products that have different materials within them. So we talked a little bit about the stresses that can be seen at component interfaces. So if you've got components that have multiple materials, that are going to expand and contract at different rates. Um, those parts are going to be more affected by climate cycling than, say, a part that is completely homogenous and made up of uh, only one type of material. Okay, so the question is, what kind of data is useful for um, collecting or that needs to be collected to calculate your acceleration factor? Um, so as we spoke about, you can use the Arrhenius equation, but if you want to actually use field data, uh, what you can do is actually have a part um, that goes through normal wear and tear, normal use, um, or maybe even uh, uh, use on the shelf. Um, and then you actually want to perform testing in the lab as well. And you can compare the failure modes both in the lab and the failure modes that are seen in the field. And you can use um, that data to compare the different um, times, the different durations of testing to get your acceleration factor that way. Okay. Well, that's all I have for you guys. Hopefully you all found this helpful. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.